will you just tell us about it's particularly the work in Nepal and involving the the boys that you show in your TED talk carrying the stone sure sure you know those the, those young boys in Nepal uh, they were just a classic example of disposable people and and particularly in that people would go into their villages and these are very very poor villages and the parents of these kids they were just desperate to find food for them they were desperate to get them any education usually very little of either was available to them so when people came in and said, hey, we've got some work for these boys to do. It can be temporary work. You just need to come with us. They'll get plenty of food. Off they would go with them. The parents would sometimes be a little dubious, but you've got that terrible choice between my kid starving and my kid might work, and, but they're going to be away from me. It's a real devil's choice. But the parents would say, okay, uh, some of them. I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a shot. I'll, I'll, I'll risk it. But then, of course, what happens is those kids basically turn into trucks. I mean, they're just used to carry very heavy slabs of stone. In Nepal, there are very few roads, so they're carrying them down these mountain paths. They're carrying loads that are greater than their own weight. And the disposability I'm talking about is just the fact that when they stumble and go into a crevasse or break a leg or sprain an even sprain an ankle, they just take the stones off them and walk away because these kids cost so little, usually between five and ten dollars to acquire. It's not that they're buying them. It's just that they kind of hand over an advance on their wages, mm -hmm. and the parents take that and think, oh good, I can feed my other kids. But they don't know that that's it, and there's a good chance the kid's not coming back. And that's ex sadly exactly what happens with those little boys. So in your TED Talk, you talk about the fact that you don't buy people out of slavery. Mm. What is the strategy for getting boys like that out of that situation, and what is an intervention to keep something like that from happening in the first place? Well, it, th that's three great questions in a row. It, you can almost start at the back end of those mm -hmm. questions and come go the other way. Um, the interventions work. So in fact, the kids that you see in that TED Talk came to freedom and their families were also assisted to, to work together in a way that meant that they wouldn't end up in that situation again. So in that kind of situation, it's all about community organizing. And we find around the world, there's so many types of slavery which are embedded into the local social and economic system that the good old community organizing model works. So you come into the village, people who speak their, the same language, people who are usually from the same ethnicity, and they say, you know what? My kids used to be caught up in stuff like that, but I know a new way, and there's a different way to go about this. And there are people who are actually help us as well. And that <coughs> just leads on from one thing to the next to build stability, safety, awareness, and often citizenship and participation, and it usually involves ultimately getting a school together. And before you know it, you've got all the, all the ingredients to create a safe, slave-proof, and slave-free village. Now, the kids themselves, if they've already gone off with these traffickers, you've got to just track them down and, and pry them loose. What advice would you have to youth that want to get involved in issues like this? either internationally or locally. Sure. I mean, you know, I, I know what young people would like to do, right? What they would like to do is sign up for a Free the Slaves internship in Nepal over one summer and then go in and raid places where children are locked up weaving carpets and kick the door in and take a little kid in their arms and run out the door and punch the slaveholder in the nose as they go past and get out there into a beautiful sunset and look at the little slave child say, oh, thank you so much for giving me. But you know what? That's not going to happen, right? Young people, American young people, they don't speak the languages. They would never fit in because they're really just the wrong shape and color and they would be a dead giveaway in that mm -hmm. kind of a situation. So they kind of have to get over that wonderful fantasy, which I think we've all had, mm -hmm. uh, and say, what can I do that is effective? And there's just so many things that are, right? I, in some ways, I, I, I hesitate to point to very specific tasks because everybody's got talent. And what the particular talent that somebody might bring to this happens to be maybe the one, well, the anti-slavery movement needs everybody. And if, and if it's playing the clarinet, there may be a role for that. And if it's computer programming, there's sure a role for that. And, ma and accounting and, you know, painting. And I mean, it, doesn't, it, it hardly matters that if you bring your whole heart and your talents to something, you can find a way to make that a very important. But it's also true <clears throat> in a very simple way. Those people who go up and get those kids out of slavery, the local workers, the liberators, they need support. And what's remarkable is that people who do that kind of work in places like Nepal, you know their average salary is about 
$2,400 a year, wow. right? $2,400 a year. Mm -hmm. So for basically about what you spend on sandwiches, right? <laughs> for a small group for not very long, over a whole year, um, you could put a whole liberator into the field. And at the end of the year say, you know what, my club, my group, mm -hmm. you know, we got who knows how many kids out of slavery. And that also provided a job for somebody there on the ground yeah, and yeah, helped yeah. with economic development there. What do you see as the role of economic development in curtailing the, the slave trade? Well, it's very important because you've got to provide other ways to, for people who come out of slavery to, to, to do some work and get something in to, re, to be, become economically autonomous. The good news there is that unlike many other situations, like you know HIV AIDS or the disasters that come with a cyclone or a hurricane or something like that, people who come out of slavery know how to work. I mean, they really know how to work. And they often have at least one skill that they've been forced to use under slavery that they can translate into legal work immediately and get a salary for as they train up for something else. And, and so in many ways, what's been very exciting for us is our longitudinal studies of villages in northern India where we've been looking at slavery starting in slavery following them through the liberation process and then into freedom over several years and watching the economic growth and the growth in educational levels and the fall in sexual violence and the fall in illness and all this kind of thing and watching the economic stability and activity of the, of the community just spiral up and up and up. Because once people come out of slavery, they're actually kind of excited about feeding their kids and educating their kids and really working together in a community to make it better. So. You know, it, it's, it doesn't take much to unleash that human potential. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. T um, just tell us a little bit about the course. What is in that? What oh. will you get out of taking the course? <clears throat> so we have what they call a MOOC, a massive online open course uh, from the University of Nottingham through FutureLearn, which is a big provider of these things in the UK. And it's called Ending Slavery. And it's, base, it's a four-week course. And it's all mixed together of uh, films and readings and interviews and a little bit of talking to camera, but not too much, and exercises. And it covers a whole series of things all about moving in the direction of how we learn to get people out of slavery, but also with an interesting focus on the, what we call the anti-slavery usable past, which means given that there were three global anti-slavery movements before this one, we're on the fourth one now, but most of us don't even know what they were or have learned any of the lessons of their failures or successes. So we tried to build that in as, as well. We think there's something very important to learn from the past with today. Uh, we had about, in the, we ran it for the first time this past fall and had about six and a half thousand students from 150 countries wow. signed up. And the feedback was uh, much better than I hoped it would be. I mean, it turned out to be really great. Yeah. And, uh, and so we've been very happy. We're going to polish it up and poli you know, make it even better for the next go-round, which will probably be in the fall.